I've been really delighted with the response to our first episode of Nightscape Photography Workshops Online. I certainly appreciate all your comments and feedback because it helps me get a better understanding of what you'd like to see covered in future episodes. When I run my group workshops here in Australia, we spend a lot of time getting to know each other and discuss what experiences we've all had with photography. Now obviously this format's different, but I'd like to think we still have a community of like-minded people dropping in and chatting. That's something I like a lot. Now, don't forget the free PDF workshop guide download, as well as my quick reference guides to help with camera settings and the like. Now some people like to print these out and put them in the camera bags, and that's fine by me. As well as that, I'll be offering free RAW files with each of these workshop online videos, so you can play with the editing yourself at home. Also, don't forget to check out the PayPal option on my website. Yes, this content is going out free of charge, but I still need to put food on the table, and I'm so thankful for those of you who have been able to support this project financially. I'd also like to make special mention to Darius, who sent me a message to let me know he actually translated the workshop guide into Polish. Now that sounds like an almighty effort, my friend. Well done. And as well as that, a big shout out to Julio, who offered to put Italian and German subtitles on my videos. Now the problem is that neither of us have any idea how to do that. Now before we get on with this video, I thought it would be good if I gave you a bit more background regarding the night photography shooting guides I mentioned earlier. As you can see, these contain a lot of information regarding camera settings. So far, I haven't gone very deep into settings, but if you look at the first page of the guide with the label focusing at night, you'll see a basic sequence of events which I go through when out in the field. As you can see, I've dedicated a whole page to this tricky subject of focusing the camera to infinity. Now, of course, there are variables when selecting camera settings, depending on what gear you have. This sheet is a general reference guide only, and is simply a starting point. For example, I've listed to set the shutter speed at 20 seconds on one side of the guide, but on the other side, it's listed as 10 seconds to 25 seconds. As I've mentioned many times, the shutter speed needs to be selected in accordance with the focal length of the lens you're using. But this is a good starting point at least for most wide angle lenses when you wanna get a shot. It's the same with white balance. I'm sure many of you are shooting on auto white balance, now my strong suggestion is to set the white balance to a color that suits you and leave it there for the night. My advice is to never leave any camera settings on auto when shooting nightscape images. Now a lot of you are gonna to say to me, oh well, if you're shooting RAW, you can change the white balance in Lightroom when editing. Yeah, of course you can, but manually setting white balance is a good habit to get into, especially when you're shooting a sequence such as star trials, or time lapse, or even panoramas. It's a lot easier to have the whole white balance consistent between each of the images, and I can tell you that from experience. Anyway, I'd like to do a quick review of the first episode. Briefly, we talked about these topics. We talked about mindset before going out to shoot. What hinders us from going out? We talked at length about tripods and the various struggles people have with them out there in the field. And we talked at even greater length about focus issues, particularly how to find infinity focus. Now I wanna briefly talk about people's methods of finding infinity focus. I'll often ask my workshop participants to give me some suggestions on methods that they have used in the past to find infinity focus on their cameras. The most common response is to turn the lens to the very end of its travel and then back it off a smidge. Another common one is to go outside during the daylight and autofocus on a hill or a mountain or something and then put some tape on the lens so it stays put. Others will mark their lens with a texter so they can go back to that same spot next time. Now I could go on, but the interesting thing about all this is that when I ask people how they came about those methods, they'll invariably say that they either heard it from someone else, or they read it online somewhere. Regardless of the accuracy of these methods, which may well have a few flaws, this leads me to another interesting topic that I want to address here before we go any further. Now, 
I'm a big believer in the sideways learning concept. I don't profess to know everything about nightscape shooting by any means, and I don't think anybody does. So we need to learn from each other. When we come together in my workshops, I encourage people to share how they go about achieving certain results with their photography. Invariably, someone will say, wow, I've never actually tried that before. I'll have to give it a go. You see, we learn from each other, not just the person up the front doing all the talking. Let me put it this way. Perhaps I'm looking to buy a lens for my nightscape photography. I've done a lot of research and I've checked out all the online reviews, but I'm still confused. Some say the lens is great, while others bag it and say, don't bother. Who do you believe? Now, before I answer that question, I'd like to illustrate an issue that we all face in this modern digital world. Now, I'd like to show you something that I illustrate to my people who come to my workshops. And hey, this is a workshop, so I'm going to do it here as well. I want to use this light. This is a Z96 video light as a little bit of a, a guide to how things can change and how people can get the wrong idea just because they're listening to somebody else's opinion of something. So let's begin over here. This is our first reviewer of this product. So they're saying, this is a Z96 video light. It's got 96 LEDs. It is a Sony NPF 750 battery, which is a 7.4 volt, 4400 milliamp, and it dims, as you can see. All right, fantastic. Let's move to the next person. Now, the next person is saying this is a Z90 video light. It has uh, a Sony, yes, still Sony battery, but it's now become a... Uh, 10,000 milliamp battery and yep still dims so that's that's a bonus let's move to the next person the next person is telling us that this is now a z80 video like you get my drift here things are changing as we go down the line uh, it has a panasonic battery and it's a it's a six volt battery now and it's only 2000 milliamps and it doesn't dim anymore let's move to the next person so the next person here is telling us this is a Z50 video light. Now this is becoming laughable, but you know what? They don't even bother to count. And there's so many people who are believing what this person is saying about this light. They're saying it's got a Canon battery. Oh, so suddenly it's a Canon battery, it's a 12 volt battery, and yep, she doesn't dim. Do you get what I mean? Now, if you look at the facts of all of this, with all the facts in front of us, it's laughable. And yet this is happening day in and day out all the time. There are people sprouting all of these things online and there are people on YouTube. My suggestion is listen to people who actually have the product, people who have actually used the product because otherwise you'll get influenced by these people who don't have any idea what they're talking about. And you know, the world is full of such people. Now, right up front, I'd like to tell you people that you shouldn't believe everything I say. If I can't give you a reason for doing something, then you're entitled to ask me why you should believe me. My job isn't so much to show you how to do something, rather it's to help you understand why you need to do it. There's a big difference there, and you'll find lots of people telling you how to do something without filling in the why question. So, who do I believe when choosing a lens for my nightscape photography? It's a no-brainer, really. I'll believe a person who actually owns and uses the lens. And I can tell you that not all YouTube reviewers have used the equipment they've used to review for more than five minutes. Reviewers are a dime a dozen, and I'd much prefer to listen to someone who actually uses the product, and even more so if it's in their primary kit bag. Apart from that, you can get some quite good information on the lens in question from a secondary source. For example, you may have a friend who uses this particular lens. You've been out shooting with them and you've seen the resulting images. This is what I call second-hand information. Not as good as first-hand, but far better than third or fourth or fifth-hand info as per my illustration with the light earlier. Okay, I think you get the drift of what I'm saying here. Let's move on. Today's episode is entitled, How to Find the Milky Way. The images you may have seen on my videos on this channel very often feature the beautiful Milky Way galactic core. There's no doubt that this particular section of the sky is the jewel in the crown when it comes to nightscape images. 
So whatever you happen to place in the foreground of the image comes alive even more when accompanied by the absolutely gorgeous and I guess somewhat mystical Milky Way core. The question many people have is where in the sky do I find this Milky Way core? Heaps of people struggle with this and it's my intention to give you some tools to make that task a little easier. There are plenty of apps on the market today to help with this, but I want to concentrate on two of the ones I find very helpful, Stellarium and Photopills. Stellarium can be downloaded free of charge to your desktop computer and for a few dollars more on a mobile device. Stellarium Mobile is a fully featured planetarium for your phone. It shows a realistic night sky map in 3D, just like what you see with a naked eye, binoculars or a telescope. The sensor control will also enable you to identify what you see in the sky in just a few seconds, just by pointing the phone at it. I find the desktop version of Stellarium to be absolutely fantastic, and so I'd like to show you some of its features. So when you first open up Stellarium on your desktop, you will be confronted with the view as it stands right now. It's the middle of the afternoon, and so we've got daylight. You can see there's a south, southeast, east compass markers there they come into play later on i'll talk about that so firstly we go into this little side menu you've got location time date sky viewing options and there's a few others down there i'm only really going to be looking at the top three now firstly the top one is a location window click on that and you actually put your location in either via gps or just by picking it out of any of these locations so i've got my city of Bendigo in Australia listed there, you can see on the little map. So I'll just, I'll just show you a bit more of that later. But the second thing down is the time and date window. Click on that and you'll see that this comes up here and it just gives you the time, date that we're at now. Now, if I just move forward in time, I'll go per hour. So now we've got night time. So 1926, what's that, half past seven? Or thereabouts so that's what the sky facing south to southeast looks tonight here in my location that's the core of the milky way but it's underneath the ground it hasn't risen at that time so if i just go through in time a little bit a couple of hours you can see there that the milky way core here is starting to rise on the eastern horizon now this is invaluable i'm going through via the minutes now to show you what it looks like and right there you can see the moon just here rising up so that's at about half past 10 tonight on on this date i'll just zoom in there i zoom in by the way by scrolling using the the wheel on the mouse so i can see the phase and crescent of the moon that's exactly what the moon's going to look like tonight uh, go back again you can see here's the milky way core now the thing that i love about this particular program is that i can plan around for example whether there's a moon or not so if I think, well, there's too much moon there tonight, I can just go to tomorrow night. And if I do that, I'll just go to the next day here, the 14th, suddenly there's no moon there. So I'll go through an hour, there's the moon. So about an hour later tomorrow night, the moon will rise. And the next day after that, it's about another hour, as you can see. And there's, again, you can see here, there's Jupiter and Saturn there in a nice little line on the horizon there. So. The first thing that I use this program for is just to locate, firstly, the direction where I can find the Milky Way core, which is what we're talking about in this episode. And secondly, where other things are. For example, if there's moonlight, where there's planets in the sky, this is basically a planetarium and it's absolutely awesome. Now, I mentioned these compass markers. You can see that's east, southeast, northeast. If I can scroll around, I can get to south. Once again, I'm just grabbing the clicking the mouse and dragging the screen. That's how I get. So that's due south, okay? So that, there's a bit of a view of from east to west sky. The Milky Way core going right across. Now, this is the Milky Way galactic core here. This is what I would classify as sort of the tail of the Milky Way. All right, now let's just go back again to tonight. And I'm gonna go back in time to about, about half past 10. That's just when that moon's coming up. One of the things that I've mentioned to you before on this channel is that I use a simple compass to work out my direction of where the Milky Way is going to be. So right now I can see it's in the east, but if I go down to the bottom of this screen 
and hover my, my mouse over the bottom. You'll see this other menu appear and just here is a grid. I'm going to click on that grid and you can see suddenly compass bearings appear on the screen. Now where this Milky Way core lines up here is anywhere between 100 degrees and 120, 130 degrees east. Now that's really awesome because all I need to do is get a compass out when I'm outside turn it to 110, 120 degrees east and I know that's exactly where the core is going to be. I don't need anything else. So that's one of the things that I love about this program. Now as I go through time, let me just demonstrate this. I'll go through per hour as we did before. You can see the core rising up higher into the sky. Now it's still roughly at that 100, 110 degree latitude um, compass bearing, but it's starting to go higher and a little bit more towards the, the north. If I keep going, I'll go through the whole night. So here we go. That's 3, 4, 5.30 tomorrow morning. The Milky Way in my location here in Australia is directly overhead. Now I know it's difficult for you to judge that because it's not a, a spherical program. It's a flat view. But at 5.30, 6.30, well you can see at 6.30 the sun is just about ready to rise. So that we've gone too far there. So we can just go back in minutes. You can see the program actually illustrates the sunrise coming, which is absolutely amazing. So I'm just going back in minutes here and you can see the Milky Way core there. Now one thing that you can see clearly here is that those stars are moving and rotating around something. So if I just go down the bottom here again and click on this equatorial grid, you can clearly see this is the South Celestial Pole. Now I'm in the Southern Hemisphere. You guys in the Northern Hemisphere, you just look at the Northern view and you'll get the same effect. Now this point here in the sky is where all the stars are rotating around. So just watch this. I'll just go backwards again. You can see everything is rotating around that point in the sky. So depending on where your latitude is on the planet, that is the position that will be in the sky. In the Southern Hemisphere, that's in the South. In the northern hemisphere it's in the north now once again if i go back to this uh, location window it shows me uh, where i am in in the world it tells me the latitude so here it is 36 degrees i don't know the, all of these seconds and everything but it's basically about 36 37 degrees south so where i am located in the southern hemisphere that point is 37 degrees above the horizon so that is the south celestial pole now for you guys in the Northern Hemisphere, you have a pole star called Polaris, which is just about on that point in the north. Now I think it's about a degree off, but it's close enough to give you a really good indication of where it is. So once again, this program tells me where things are. Now, as I said to you before, if you move through space and time, you can see everything rotating around that South Pole. Let me just get it a bit closer and make it a bit easier. Have a look at that. Everything's going round and round in the circle. So when you hear about people using star trackers, all they do is line up the star tracker to that point in the sky and it simply rotates at the same speed that the Earth is rotating. And that locks your camera onto whatever your target may be in the sky. That's how star trackers work. I mentioned before that we set our time and date here on the top one. So let's go back to the location window. Now, just so if I wanted to position that somewhere else, what about in Europe? Uh, use current location as a default. Okay, let's do that. So I'm in Germany at the moment. That's 10 o'clock in the morning. So we'll go through facing east still into the night. There we go. We've got night time here in Germany. Now things look completely different in Germany to what they did in uh, my part of Australia. You can see that. There's our Milky Way core right there. So let's just have a look. Now you can see the Milky Way core rising up into the sky, but it's going in opposite direction to what it was for me in Australia. And there is the moon rising up. Now, for this spot in Germany where I'm looking at here, it's about 3.30 uh, in the morning when the Milky Way core is visible with that moon coming up. Now, once again, if I go to the next day, you'll notice that the moon disappears because it's about an hour behind. So I'll go an hour further and there it is as I showed you before, except I was looking in a Southern Hemisphere view before, now I'm looking in the Northern Hemisphere. So I'll go to the next day, that's the 16th, and you can see that moon there rising up again an hour later. So once again, the Milky Way here is scrolling across the sky, 
and it has a completely different perspective to what I'm used to seeing it in the south. Isn't that amazing? You can see there in a completely dark sky, the Milky Way core has a fair bit of structure and you can see all sorts of things. Okay, so I'm back home again, back to where I live here in Australia. And you can see the sky here. Now I wanna show you something that's really, really cool. This is showing us on the 14th of the 4th, 2020 at about, let's just go to um, 10.30, there we go. The point I want to make to you is that you can advance in time or go back in time and you will notice the view doesn't change much at all. What does change is the moon and the planets and things that move across the sky independently of the, the uh, galactic core. So let's go a year forward. There's 2021. The Milky Way is still there in exactly the same place at the same date and the same time. Let's go another year and another one. And you can see the core, it's just hovering around it's hardly moving at all i'm now at 2026 and there it is still in the same place now let's go back a few years let's go back i don't know um 2005 it's still there it doesn't matter now this is the point i'm making to you so if i put my lines back on you can see it's still lining up at that 110 120 degree mark in the eastern sky at the same date and one of the things I use this for all the time is, okay, I'm planning a trip somewhere. Oh, I know where I'm going to be at, and a date I'd like to go. What is the sky going to look like then? I want to go on holiday on the 14th of September, 2021. Now, suddenly everything's changed. Where's the Milky Way? It's gone. Well, it's gone because later in the year, in September, the Milky Way has made its way across to the other side of the sky. So I just scroll around and you can now see I'm facing west. Major, major problem we've got here. We've got a moon. Let me see. Yeah, it's about a half moon. Right in the center of where the Milky Way core is. Now, obviously, that's going to be no good for me shooting nightscapes on the 14th of September, 2021. So I'm not going to go on holidays to this location at that date. I'm going to choose another day. So what if I go... A week before that let's go back to the seventh okay now you can see there's no moon because a week prior the moon is well i don't know where the moon is let's have a look you can go down and actually remove the ground and you can see where the sun is there we go so remember this is under the horizon and there's the sun and the moon is right near the sun now what does that mean it's a new moon the moon is not going to be visible in the night sky so by applying this little earth ground symbol at the bottom, I can actually can look underground and see where the, where the sun or where the moon or where anything else is. So here we go. Back to my time, 7th of September, 2021 at about 10.30 p.m. So it's quite a reasonable hour to be out shooting the night sky. I've got this gorgeous view of the Milky Way stretching across the western sky. Now I have to apologize to you guys who live in the northern hemisphere. You don't get this view. We have an absolutely amazing view of the Milky Way and all of the constellations pretty much from February, March, all the way through to October. It's absolutely fantastic. And the further south you go, the further overhead it becomes. Now, for you guys in the United States, let's, let's pick somewhere there. Um, how about um, Austin, Texas? Uh, let's go there. I'm going to use that as my current location, so I'll set that. What are we looking at here? Well, it's daytime. So let's move to our date and time window. 7 o'clock in the evening, 8, 9 uh, in the morning, sorry. Let's move through. Okay, now we're starting to get into the evening. I'm still in 2021. You'll have to excuse that, but it doesn't matter for the illustration purpose here. Let's move forward until we get that Milky Way. There it is. Now, it's not that much different to what we're seeing in Germany, although the core in your location in Texas is going to be a bit higher than it is in Germany. That's because it's a little bit further south down towards the equator. Because we're on a sphere, the, the Earth is round, the further you travel north or south determines what view of the sky that you actually see. About 5.30 in the morning on the 14th of the 4th, 2021, we see from Austin, Texas, we see the Milky Way core standing up in the south, pretty much due south. And you can see there you've got Jupiter and Saturn. Now, this is fantastic. Now, you guys are probably going to ask me, well, okay, what's it like in Austin in September? Let's go to September and just see. 
So there we go. Oh, there's that moon. Remember we said there was a moon there. That's not going to do us any good. But in September, just after sunset, you've got the core. Now let's just go back to get rid of that moon again like I did before. Okay, 7th of September 2021. And here we are at half past eight in the evening. Let's just move through. You can see the core there stretching across the south towards the southwestern sky. Beautiful. So you get some really, really nice Milky Way shots in that direction. Now let's get our grid back on. Now for you guys, let's have a look. That's about 200 degrees on a compass. So if you guys get the compass out and point it to 200 degrees or 210 thereabouts, you will see the Milky Way core in September. Now, I mentioned to you earlier, it doesn't matter what year, that's absolutely true. This could be 2021, it could be 2020, it could be 2019, 2018. See, it's still in exactly the same place. The only thing moving around is the planets and the moon. 200 degrees in September. So all you need to do is use a compass. And that is the reason I love this program so much. Obviously, there are so many things built into this program. It's not my intention here to go into what all of these things do, but you can look at various sky objects. You can change the landscape uh, and things like that. You can change the intensity of the screen. You can look at various constellations laid over the top of the screen. I never really like the look of that. It looks a bit cheesy to me. Um, as I said, you can take out the horizon, you can show stars and planets and names and all sorts of things. This is literally a planetarium on your desktop computer, which is absolutely fantastic. I'm going to talk about photo pills in a minute, but before I do, I'd like to address a question I get all the time from people. How do you get permission to enter private property to shoot your nightscapes? Now that's something I've worked on over the years and there are plenty of times when I've been driving along a country road somewhere and I'll see some old farm machinery out of the corner of my eye way over in a paddock. A quick look over the fence is all I usually need to work out whether there's a shot to be had there. But the next question is always, I wonder who actually owns this property. From there, I'll start knocking on doors trying to find out firstly who owns the property and secondly, if it's okay to go onto the property to shoot nightscapes. This can be quite a lengthy process, but when I do find the landholder, their initial reaction is often, well, it's actually quite funny, really. You want to photograph the old harvester? Why would you want to do that? Now, it's at this point I bring out one of my nightscape calendars and show them what the old harvester might look like with a bit of light painting. You see, I think it's really important for me to put them at ease from the start. They don't know me from a bar of soap. And here I am asking to enter their property in the dead of night to photograph some old machine or a fence post or whatever. To be honest, they're summing me up during this time. And I try to make some quiet conversation, I guess, to help put them at ease. One thing I can tell you about Australian farmers is that they can talk the leg off an iron pot once they get going. I used to work in a spare parts shop and heaps of our customers were farmers, so I do understand their lingo. Anyway, the end result is that I'll invariably get permission to come back at some stage to shoot on their property. And when I do that, I'll often make a print of the old farm machinery and deliver it to them as a gesture to say thanks, I suppose, for letting me come onto their property. On more than one occasion at this point, the farmer will let me know of another even better machine which is hidden away somewhere deeper on the property. And in some cases, they even take me for a drive to have a look for myself. At this point, I've formed a relationship with these guys and they start talking with their friends about this bloke who takes photos of old broken down farm machines and turns them into a work of art. I'll tell you what, you can't beat word of mouth advertising. So what does all that have to do with photo pills? Well, absolutely nothing at all, really. But if you want to find great foreground subject matter to shoot, I'd highly recommend talking with landholders and owners in your district. You just don't know what will come out of it. Okay, so on to photo pills. I don't use all the tools in the photo pills package, but they have an abundance of great programs and guides available to photographers, both on their website and on their mobile app. Last week, I showed you the depth of field table on the PhotoPills website. This week, 
I want to show you my most used part of the PhotoPills mobile app, Augmented Reality. Now what I'd like to do is have a look at the Augmented Reality view in PhotoPills on my tablet. So we're going to go outside now and just have a look and just see what we can find out in the backyard. I'm also going to show you some other examples from out in the field. So let's head out here and just have a bit of a squeeze. Oh wow, what an absolutely gorgeous day. This is what you get here in Australia, beautiful weather every single day. Now let's have a look at this augmented reality view. Okay, so I want to go through the Photo Pills app very briefly. I'm going to show you some other examples out in the field. So, first things first, we open up the app on our tablet. You can see it here. And I've gone to the augmented reality view. Now, what it does, it automatically senses the GPS, which is built in to the tablet device itself. Up on the top left hand corner, you have the date and the time. And what you do, you can see a real time view of what's in front using the camera on the phone or the tablet. So what I'm doing by grabbing my finger and just moving it along like so, I'm moving through time and you will see, there we have it. The Milky Way core coming up on the screen just between those two trees over there. Now, you can see there that the moon is just behind it. So this is telling me that tonight, if I was to look at there at about midnight roughly um, the milky way core is going to be there in the sky but the moon which is about a 50 percent crescent moon is also there in the sky in the same spot so that's no good but you can see how it works i can move through time simply by moving my finger across now i'm facing east i can face this any direction i want and still see what the view is in the sky so it's fantastic for finding the milky way the Milky Way core comes right over the top of the engine. Now this is facing in the southeast. Now that's at about 4 a.m. at this time of year, but that will change depending on what time of year we come here. So, yep, that looks fantastic. So this is the augmented reality view of photo pills, which is really, really handy for planning in the daytime like it is now, what you can see over the top of a foreground subject like this old train facing down towards the eastern sky and it works out beautifully the milky way will come up in fact i can get it coming up on either side of the tree depending on where i position my camera my plan is just to put it up right here on this fence now you can see very clearly here the photo pills app where it shows the milky way coming down the left hand side of the tree you can see the tree there in the background and the time now is 4 39 a.m and that's exactly what it said earlier when I was here during the daytime. Uh, so this app is very accurate. Now I know a lot of you are going to ask me about the planning part of the PhotoPills app. The simple answer is that I don't use it. Now that's not because it doesn't work. It's because for me personally, I have a system I'm happy with using information from Stellarium, Google Maps and a simple compass. After you've been doing this for a while, it sort of gets ingrained into your brain where the Milky Way core is at different times of the year and even at different times of the night. So if I want to shoot a particular bridge as a foreground subject, then I'll work out the compass bearing and know that when I get there, I'll be sort of in the right general direction. Remember, I'm using wide angle lenses here, which simplifies this process quite a bit. If I'm trying to line up something with a 500 millimeter lens, then that changes things a lot. So as I showed you earlier, I do line up the Milky Way core using the augmented reality view in PhotoPills, but I usually do this prior to actually arriving to shoot if at all possible. So I'll visit the location during the day and just get a view of the scene in front of me, including the overlay in real time of the Milky Way. The reason I do this is more about composition than actually knowing where the core is in the sky. I want to be able to get a visual of how the scene will look and this tool in PhotoPills helps me immensely with that. Now, this topic of composition is extremely important. In fact, so important, I'll be dedicating a whole episode to creative composition next week. But before I finish this week's episode, I'd like to touch again on something that really bugs me sometimes. And that is this preoccupation people have with copying exactly what other people do 
rather than creating their own piece of magic with their photography. Now, this is by no means a criticism of people learning the craft of photography. It's more an observation and trend I've noticed right across the board with all genres of photography. My concept of learning is that you get the assistance you need by someone who has knowledge on the subject. From there, you try out these principles for yourself. But the next important step is to use that knowledge learnt as a launching pad for your own creative ideas. And this is where a lot of people stall and don't actually take that final step. Once again, we find some of the things I mentioned last week concerning hindering our photography rearing their ugly heads. We start comparing ourselves with others. I'll never be able to do that. I can't afford that latest camera model. You get what I'm saying, the list is endless. I'm getting off track, but hey, that's how I run my nightscape workshops out at the farm, so why should this be any different? Suffice to say that I have very strong opinions regarding how we think and respond, and most importantly, develop our creativity rather than simply applying a group of camera settings each time we go out to shoot. I'll be delving deeper into this as we go through the course, but for the moment I wanna finish by referring you to a video I produced recently entitled Planning a Milky Way Photo Shoot. In this video, I go through a lot of what I've discussed with you today. I'll provide a link to that video on the final screen and below this video. But as well as that, I'll be providing some raw files on this finished image for you to play with on my website. Now this is a stacked sky shot blended with a few foreground images to achieve the final result. The three pieces of software I used to produce this image were Lightroom for the basic image editing, Sequator for stacking and noise reduction, and Photoshop for the final blending of the image. I fully realize I haven't gotten into shooting or even post-production at this stage of the course, but I have many videos on my channel here that address those things. Again, I'll link a few below to help with your research. This Nightscape Photography Workshop online is one whole course made up of many parts. It's a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. It'll make a whole lot more sense after it's completed when you can look back on the various topics discussed and perhaps revisit some of those raw files to edit again. And so to summarize what we've learned during this episode, be careful when seeking advice, only trust reliable sources. We talked about using apps to help us find the Milky Way in the night sky, Stellarium, photo pills, simple compass. We also discussed talking with farmers and landholders about accessing their properties to shoot. We discussed the sideways learning concept and how we can learn a lot from rubbing shoulders with other photographers and seeing how they go about doing things. I'm absolutely delighted that you've joined me here again to discuss my favorite topic of nightscape photography. As most of you already know, it's a difficult subject to get a handle on, but I can tell you the journey makes it all the more worthwhile, especially when we're all on it together. So until our next video, I hope you guys have an awesome week and I'll look forward to seeing you then.